In so many ways the chivalric layers of society thought and acted as conventionally pious Christians. They followed the set course for life, from baptism at the church fought to the final rites and prayers as their bodies were lowered into sanctified ground. Along the way, cellular acts of piety structured the religious component of their daily lives. They heard mass, they made confession, they said prayers, they gave alms. Many reinforced this lifelong cycle by some major act, going on crusade, or founding a religious house. Many, likewise, sought the surety of a religious order as intimations of mortality came forcibly into their consciousness. Chivalric literature portrayed and reinforced this orthodoxy. It reminded the knights of the undeniable function of priests in the sacramental system of which they were willing, prudent participants. A layman, even a knight, needed priests as conduits for divine grace, especially at critical, liminal points in life. Knights in this literature regularly state their fear of dying without confession. In Cratine's Perceval, one key injunction the hero hears from his mother as he starts out into the world is to go to church or chapel to hear Mass regularly. Galahad, as readers of the quest of the Holy Grail learned, always chafed if a day passed without his hearing the Holy Office. Lancelot in the Mordar II regularly hears Mass and says the proper prayers, as a Christian knight should. He confesses to an archbishop before his single combat with Gawain. Balain and his brother, dying tragically from their mutually inflicted wounds, take the sacrament and beg Christ for forgiveness of their sins, they receive their rights, such as Christian knights should have, and ask forgiveness of their Savior for their sins and misdeeds. Gautier similarly visits a church to pray before his single combat in Raoul de Cambrai, though in this case the author tarnishes the bright ideal image with a realistic comment. On this occasion there was no joking, nothing omitted. In their battlefield prayers, knights themselves present many sermons complete with summations of basic Christian dogma, or they listen to similar sermons preached to them by clerics, as do the knights of the Chanson d'Aspermont. In fact, in our literary evidence knights seem to swim in a sea of piety, using religious language even in situations that strike modern sensibilities as purely secular. In God's name, I am called the Marquis William, announces William of Orange to his opponent in the crowning of Lewis. In God's name, I think you will find him the most comely and well-made youth you have ever seen, Sir Yvain says to the Queen, speaking of Lancelot in the Lancelot du Lac. King Louis solemnizes over relics his obligations to give Raoul a fief. William of Orange swears over relics to protect King Louis. All knights swear constantly by some favorite saint, or by the relics in some church near at hand. Roland and Ganelon carry weapons bearing sacred relics within their hilts. Gawain, in the marvels of Rigomer has the names of the Trinity inscribed on his sword blade. The great waves which well up from this sea of piety are not lacking in chivalric literature. Gerard founds a monastery for 300 monks in the Chanson d'Aspermont. Of course, crusade features so largely in chivalric literature, especially in works traditionally classed as epic, as almost to defy illustration. Imaginative literature is supported by more traditional historical sources. The chivalric example par excellence in the late 12th century, William Marshall went on pilgrimage to Cologne, fought as a crusader, founded a religious house, and died in the robe of a Templar, having made provision to be received into the order years before. His biographer records William's belief that all his knightly achievement was the personal gift of God. Geoffroy de Charny similarly went on crusade and founded a religious house. Through a sheaf of papal licenses, granted in response to his requests, we can sense his piety no less than his influence. He had the right to a portable altar, the right to receive from his confessor a plenary indulgence when facing death, the right to hear a first mass of the day before sunrise, the right to have a family cemetery alongside the church he founded. As readers of his Book of Chivalry, we know in detail how thoroughly he agreed with William Marshall's belief in God as the fountainhead of all chivalric honor. Charney sets out this formula time and again. A healthy mixture of fear and gratitude can be the only proper response on the part of knights. Charney, in fact, almost floats in pieties on the pages of his book. Marshall and Charney were model knights, however, and not simply model Christians. In company with all knights, they lived by the sword, and the founder of their religion had said some troubling words about such lives. Their violent vocation necessarily shaped their practice of religion. 
their piety scarcely could be that of merchants or craftsmen. The tension between the ideal standards of their Christianity and the daily practice of violence brings us back to the issues raised by Twain's harsh dichotomies. In fact, the knightly solution seems clear and characteristic. They largely appropriated religion. They absorbed such ideas as were broadly compatible with the virtual worship of prowess and with the high sense of their own divinely approved status and mission. They likewise downplayed or simply ignored most strictures that were not compatible with their sense of honor and entitlement. This seeming paradox, in fact, formed one of the structural features of chivalric ideology and a great source of its strength. For in one of its essential dimensions chivalry rested on the very fusion of prowess and piety. It functioned as the male, aristocratic form of lay piety. It was itself, in other words, an embodiment of the religious force that worked so powerfully to shape society, at least from the 12th century. The worship of the demigod prowess was merged with medieval Christianity. If sometimes the yawning gap separating the two systems of belief stimulated inspired writing, more often the gap was simply, willfully, not seen. In a prologue to his translation of Christine de Pisson's Epistle of Othea, Stephen Scrope assured Sir John Fastolf that God Having spent most of his life, Festolf should now turn to prepare himself. The key trait of knightly prowess wins divine approbation. Disloyalty and anything leading to dishonor becomes sin, a moral and not merely a social blunder. Earning honor by prowess appears throughout most chivalric literature as complementary to the worship of God. Approval for prowess comes not only from humans, but descends from highest heaven. In fact, God opens wide the doors of paradise for his brave knights. Geoffroy de Charny cannot often enough or forcefully enough preach that prowess, like all good things, comes as a gift of God, that the Lord will welcome his good knights, those who use this great gift well, into paradise. By the time he wrote, in the mid-14th century, the theme had been well developed. Promises of heavenly reward for crusaders punctuate both Chanson's digest and historical accounts of crusade preaching. This valorization, as we will see, gradually became a blessing on all of knightly life. The approbation of God appears time and again. Early in the history of the Holy Grail Seraphi receives the gift of great prowess from God. Fighting against the enemies of the early Christians, no feat of arms could be compared to his prowess, performed with his hands, for he held a marvelously strong and sharp battle-axe in both hands. Using this weapon, he cut strong shields, sliced thick hauberks, cleaved helmets and visors. He slashed feet, legs and arms, chests, heads, ribs and thighs. He bathed his battle axe up to the shaft in the blood of men and horses. Seraphi heroically keeps up the work even after he is unhorsed and trampled by two hundred horsemen. Christ himself, acting through the white knight, supplies him with a new and even more efficient axe. As the white knight announces, handing it over, here, Seraphi, this is sent to you by the true crucified one. If God supplies the weapons, he can also direct the blows. In the Didot Perceval Arthur splits the Roman emperor down to the waist with a great sword stroke delivered with the aid of God. The Almighty is pictured as a fine judge as well as a general approver of prowess. The ship of faith that he sends to the three companions in the quest of the Holy Grail carries a sword reserved for the knight with the greatest prowess. Its blade bears the daunting message, written appropriately in bloodred letters, that none should be so bold as to draw the sword unless he was to strike better and more boldly than anyone else. The penalty for a failed attempt is injury or death. However much we spiritualize such a symbol, we must stop to consider its message at the most apparent level. God provides a test for determining the best knight, that is, the one with the greatest prowess, the divine gift to knighthood. God, as he appears in chivalric literature, likes knightly doing and daring, even if reformers were careful to picture him on their side. For his worthy knights, moreover, God supplies opportunities. Divine power holding the sunlight to give Charlemagne light for his bloody revenge, after the death of Roland, is only the most well-known case in point. Finding a beautiful glade, early in the Pearl's Vows, Perceval's immediate, almost reflexive thought is that two knights could joust well and handsomely on that ground. He prays to God. 
In your gentleness let a knight appear with whom I can test whether there is strength or valor or chivalry in me. God sends one of the best, in fact, for Lancelot appears and the two nearly kill one another, though in the great rage that they bore each other and the great ardor of their will. They were hardly aware of their wounds. Providentially, a hermit appears to end this conflict of uncle and nephew who, as always in such fights, recognize each other only after the combat has ended. Divine approval of prowess is often conveyed by saints or angels. Gabriel appears in Roland, for example, not only to carry away Roland's soul to its well-earned rest, but to urge on Charlemagne when his prowess slips a bit in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the pagan Amaral. Dazed, his skull creased by a mighty sword blow. Charles hears Gabriel, standing like a coach by his side, demand, Great King, what are you doing? Charlemagne quickly recovers and spills his opponent's brains. The Virgin Mary retrieves Renouart's great cudgel for him on a battlefield in the Chanson de Guillaume when he has unfortunately left it behind. In one popular story, the Virgin even jousted for a knight who missed a tournament because of his devotions to her. The military saints similarly do more than approve or enable the warriors, of course. Both Chronicle and Chanson de Getz depict them joining in the fight. Such an accommodation of the Christian God within the ideas of knighthood thus provides a third crucial element in the tough metallic alloy of chivalry, adding strength to further fusions we will explore in detail later. Prowess alloyed with honor, with high status, and with love. Knights conceived of chivalry as a practiced form of religion, not merely as knighthood with a little pious and restraining overlay. Through the practice of chivalry, the heroic life and ideals, which carried a strong sense of independent moral standards, combined with selected principles of medieval Christianity. Through chivalric ideas and practices, warriors fused their violent way of life and their dominance in society with the will of God. Moreover, there was another benefit to the bargain, powerfully present even if seldom stated explicitly. Knights know that God will understand and forgive the slips that mar their moral scorecards, especially since the very toughness of their lives functions as a form of penance. This knightly belief appears classically in Gawain's attitude on the Grail quest. Mallory tells us Gawain heard more about his sins from a hermit confessor than he wanted, and so hurried off, using the excuse that his companion, Sir Ector, was waiting for him. He had already explained to the hermit that he could accept no penance. I may do no penance, for we knighted adventures many times suffragette woo and pain. The tendency, then, was for knights to believe that they had a private arrangement with the Lord God. Their hard lives, bravely chosen and followed through all hardships, all but provided penance enough for their inevitable sins. A hermit who hears Gehiriot's confession in the Merlin continuation, for example, gave him such penance as he thought he could do along with his labor at arms. This attitude is resisted in the 13th century quest of the Holy Grail, probably because it was common. Mallory seems much more comfortable with the idea of a bargain between God and merely earthly chivalry than with the insistence on heavenly chivalry in the quest. Geoffroy de Charny, too, would have at least understood Gawain, for all the piety he wrote into his book of chivalry, for all the reverence of the clergy he insisted upon in its pages. Knightly lay piety, in short, involved an appreciable degree of practical lay independence. Chivalry took on the valorizing mantle of religion without fully accepting the directive role claimed by ecclesiastics. It virtually absorbed religion for its own purposes, in no small measure on its own terms. Knights did not simply and obediently bow before clerical authority and, bereft of any ideas of their own, absorb the lessons and patterns for their lives urged by their brothers, sisters, and cousins bearing tonsures and veils. Knights thought they had an understanding with God a contract which finally bypassed the troublesome clerics, even while paradoxically acknowledging their essential sacerdotal role. The particular nature of their piety, then, and the way in which it combined their power in the world with the valorization of otherworldly approval helps explain the strength of chivalry. Admittedly, some men in any age seem to need no justification beyond the imperious surge of their own will. But perhaps most men in most ages act more confidently when they can feel that what they want to do is not so distant from what they should do. Such reassurance in chivalry came largely from the knightly appropriation of religion. Chivalric piety acted not simply as a force in opposition to main currents of knightly life, but in consonance with them. 
The appropriation shows up clearly in historical texts such as biographies and chronicles, and not merely in those relating crusading history. In the Song of Dermot and the Earl, a chronicle of the late 12th century English invasion of Ireland, the English leader more than once urges his knights to sally forth in the name of the Almighty Father. The poet himself tells us that as the knights rush into battle from a coastal fort, they are sent by the good Jesus. Miles de Cogan calls upon them in another fight to strike, in the name of the cross. Strike, barons, nor delay at all, in the name of Jesus, the Son of Mary. His countryman Raymond Lou Grow often invoked St. David in his very martial speeches. This language can be heard century after century. Froissart says the English launched their crossing of the psalm in the campaign leading to the field at Cressy, invoking the name of God and St. George. The Black Prince, before his great battle at Nahara, uttered an equally revealing prayer, with clasped hands raised to heaven. True, Sovereign Father, who hast made and created us, as truly as thou dost know that I am not come here save for the maintenance of right, and for prowess and nobility which urge and incite me to gain a life of honor, I beseech thee that thou wilt this day guard me and my men. God, the author of prowess and honor, is expected to understand. The strong element of lay independence in chivalry appears most blatantly in blistering anticlericalism. Sometimes the imagined attacks even go beyond the verbal to become directly physical. In the coronation of Lewis, for example, a cleric tells William that some of his fellow clerics are involved in a plot against the young King Lewis. This loyal informer suggests that William behead them, despite their order, and for his part offers to take upon himself the sin of desecrating the church in this way. Blessed be the hour that such a cleric was nurtured, William replies in wonder and gratitude, though he finally decides on a lesser sacrilege. He will simply beat the tonsured traitors and toss them out of the building, commending them to eighty devils. If the abuse directed at clerics in chivalric literature is more often verbal, it is no less informative. Denunciation of priests as greedy and lecherous is standard practice, but the interesting broader goal in chivalric literature is to demonstrate the equality or even superiority of the loyal and necessary knightly function in society. Cratine has Gawain say, A man can give good advice to another who cannot heed advice himself, just like those preachers who are sinful lechers, but who teach and preach the good that they have no intention of practicing themselves. Raynouard in Ali Scans tells William, who has just forcibly conquered countless pagans, that he converts so well he should be a cleric. The knife slips in soon, however, for he then describes their soft and dissolute life in terms that bring general laughter. The biography of William Marshall refers pointedly to those standard figures of anticlerical satire, Saints Alphinus and Rabinus, and says that they are much honored at the papal court. The author of the Song of Roland, after gazing in wondering admiration at the feats of the knight or Archbishop Turpin on the battlefield, asks, rhetorically, where is the priest who drove his body to do such mighty deeds? The question would appeal to Geoffroy de Charny, who would make the same point in only slightly altered form several centuries later. Comparing the ease of a priestly career with the rigors of the knightly life, Charney notes that the clerics are spared the physical danger and the strenuous efforts of going out onto the field of battle to take up arms, and are also spared the threat of death. The author of Roland was even more explicit in his answer, however, and he presents Archbishop Turpin himself to state the case. Asking what a knight is worth who is not strong and fierce in battle, he answers his own question unambiguously, not four pennies. Instead, he should be in one of those monasteries, praying all the time for our sins. At one point William of Orange similarly and pointedly reminds King Louis that the French thought he was of little worth and wanted to make him a cleric. In another text in the same cycle William tells Louis, who has failed to take up his father's offer of the crown with vigor, that he might as well be a monk. On the arrival of Enid's father for her wedding to Eric, Cratine assures his audience that the bride's father did not have a troop of chaplains, or of silly or gaping folk, but of good knights. Never trust a priest except at confession time, says the author of the Chanson d'Aspermont. The statement has the ring of a popular maxim. Yet the religious strength of chivalry is best seen in the steady confidence expressed in the inherent value of the knightly life rather than in the cut and thrust of anticlericalism.
In its sacred mythology, chivalry is older than the clerical hierarchy, having emerged in the age and circle of Christ. The element of independence is obvious, as is the associative piety and valorization drawn from links with priestly mythology. These links appear vividly in stories about Perceval, Galahad, and the Grail. The bloodlines of Perceval and Galahad go back to that great knight Joseph of Arimathea, who cared for the entombment of that most precious relic in the world, the body of Christ, and who cared as well for that most famous sacerdotal object, the Holy Grail. In fact, in the loose and elusive way in which these romances so often suggest parallels with sacred mythology, Perceval and Galahad recall the functions of Christ himself, or at least those of his functions which would appeal most readily to knights. They spread true faith and conquer the forces of evil. These are knights for whom God performs miracles. Towards the end of the quest Galahad brings, healing to a man lame for ten years. Even Lancelot's blood performs, if not quite a miracle, a marvelous cure when it restores Agravain and the Lancelot du Lac. In Mallory's Mort d'Arthur Lancelot heals the grievously wounded Sir by a laying on of hands. Earlier, Rough-hewn examples stand behind these Christ-like scenes. The retired William of Orange has learned from his abbot that he must not fight with weapons, but only with flesh and blood. Confronted by robbers in a forest, he rips a leg off a packhorse and uses it as a club. Feeling pity for the packhorse after the fact, he replaces the leg and prays. The horse becomes whole again. An atmosphere of at least pious power thus hangs over these knights. The result is reverence. In the Lancelot, at a time when Lancelot is thought to have perished, his battered shield is kept in the center of a courtyard, with crowds of ladies, maidens, and knights dancing round it. And every time the knights or ladies came to face it, they would bow before it as before a holy relic. Again, in the Mordar II, Lancelot's shield becomes an object of veneration. Sent to the cathedral in Camelot before he leaves Logres, it soon hangs by a silver chain in the middle of the church where it is honored, as if it had been a holy relic, by the populace which flocks to see it. The value of this evidence increases when we realize that some battered shields and banners from the very real world hung in churches in memory of knights who carried them. The knights themselves can receive such veneration. After Galescalin has freed the castle of Pintadal in the Lancelot, he is greeted with the greatest possible joy by a thankful crowd and as he passed in front of them, they all fell to their knees as if before an altar. Those freed by Lancelot's splendid success at Escalon the Dark, in the same romance, welcome him as joyously as they would have hailed God himself. The same could be said of the Grail, which later writers identify with the platter that served Christ's Passover lamb, the vessel for the wine, or the vessel that received his blood. They likewise identify the bleeding lance with the lance of Longinus, which pierced Christ's side as he hung on the cross. In other words, the objective of this imagined knightly questing is nothing less than attainment of Eucharistic or mystical union with the divine. The knights strive to come to the Lord's table, there to feed on the bread of heaven dispensed by Christ himself. This quest and union are affected by the knights and their God, with only minimal sacramental mediation by priests. As we will see shortly, hermits stand like signposts on the way, pointing questing knights in the right directions, spiritually as well as spatially. But in the final moments, a few elect knights who have earned the apotheosis meet God and commune with him in a blaze of light. We have been prepared for this moment by the unmistakable lay Pentecosts and Grail appearances in the history of the Holy Grail and especially in the quest of the Holy Grail. In the latter text, at dinner on the Feast of Pentecost, after they had eaten the first course, an extraordinary event took place. All the doors and windows of the palace closed by themselves, without anyone touching them. However, the room was not darkened. A venerable man in white appears, leading into the company of veteran knights, a young knight dressed in red and white, the colors of Christ. Peace be with you, is his greeting. The young newcomer soon establishes his unique status by taking the perilous seat at the round table by drawing the sword from the stone floating in the river beside the palace, and by defeating all comers in a celebratory tournament. At the end of the day, announced by a thunderclap and illuminated by intense rays of light, the grail appears and provides each knight with his most desired food. The knights swear to quest for the holy grail. 
Medieval Christians would not miss the parallel between this scene in chivalric myth and scenes from sacred history, a blending of the first appearance of the risen Christ to the disciples in the upper room with the original Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in a rushing wind to the apostles in a closed room to set them on their great mission in the world. Christ's colors were red and white. His greeting in the upper room was, Peace be with you. In fact, the author later makes the parallelism explicit more than once. Perceval's aunt, a pious recluse, draws the connections for him point by point. Near the end of the romance, another lay Pentecost combines with a remarkable Eucharist. Galahad, Perceval, and Borse, the three elite companions on the quest, are seated in the castle of Corbinic. The sky darkens, the stormy wind makes a great hot rush through the hall, and the grail appears. The companions, their faces wet with tears of awe and love, see Christ appear from the grail, miraculously to offer them the heavenly food of his own body. They soon hear the voice of the Lord telling them, You resemble my apostles. For just as they ate with me at the Last Supper, now you will eat with me now at the table of the Holy Grail. Just as I disperse them throughout the world to preach the true law, so too will I disperse your group, some here, others there. Religious valorization of this intensity comes from texts which walk the border between the pious and the unthinkable. The essential actors in this drama are God and his knights. Christ himself participates not only as sacrifice but as officiating agent, assisted by Josephus who dramatically descends into the scene from heaven, seated on a throne carried by four angels. This son of Joseph of Arimathea is here called the first bishop. Josephus conducts at least the consecration of the host, into which Christ descends from above, in the form of a shining child, who becomes a mature human form. Josephus places this consecrated host in the grail, kisses Galahad, and vanishes. Christ himself emerges from the grail to give each knight present his savior. Lay independence hovers about this wondrous scene. If a quasi-priest officiates here, he is surely an unusual specimen. He has, for one thing, been dead for three centuries, as the marveling knights recognize when he descends from heaven. Moreover, an inscription on his brow informs the knights that he was consecrated by our Lord in Sarah's, in the spiritual palace. Josephus is decidedly not one of the clerics recognized by the priestly tradition in which the authority of God came to Peter and subsequently, by the laying on of hands, to each bishop and priest across the centuries. Even if he descends clothed in bishop's robes, holding a crozier, wearing a mitre, Josephus is a figure created by knightly lay piety to begin a ritual which ends with the appearance of Christ to feed his best knights with his own body from his own hands. The quest of the Holy Grail is far from a simple valorization of knighthood, whatever the striking parallels with sacred myth it creates for chivalry. Yet the degree to which such a work praised an idealized knighthood is fascinating and informative. Powerful ideas crackled like high-voltage, alternating current along lines connecting chevalier and clergies. If, as we will see, the pattern proposed for knighthood in a text like this soared beyond actual knights, the sacralization of their idealized work, replete with concessions to their sense of independence, remains important. The spectacular grail seen at Corbinic is a culminating experience, the apotheosis of an imagined spiritual quest. Lay assertion of independence from clerical authority appears much more regularly in the prominence of hermits in all chivalric literature, particularly in the romances. Hermits are clearly the chivalric cleric of choice. In the forests which are the setting for adventure, hermits seem to have established their dwellings at convenient intervals of one day's ride in order to accommodate knights errant who lodge with them regularly. They are figures of wisdom as well as keepers of plain hostelries for the chivalrous. A knight can find an explanation for his recent adventures or his troublesome dreams and a sure guide for his future conduct, as well as a bed, and at least barley bread and water. Hermits are ubiquitous in chivalric literature. A hermit starts Yvain on his road to recovery after madness in Cratine's Yvain. Another speaks the key advice to Perceval on Good Friday in his Perceval. Scores of hermits nourish and direct the knights throughout the quest of the Holy Grail. In fact, Hermits will play a key religious role in romance for the next several centuries. And not only in romance. The spoken advice that becomes Yui's important manual on chivalry, we must remember, likewise comes from an old hermit who is instructing a candidate for knighthood. 
The chronicler Orderic Vitalis pictures a hermit foreseeing the future at the request of Queen Matilda, consort of William the Conqueror. His elaborate vision could come from the pages of the quest. To realize why this knightly preference for hermits is significant to the lay piety of chivalry, we need to understand the kind of figure hermits represent. Two key facts seem to stand at the heart of an answer. First, both as we find them in medieval society and as they were represented in chivalric literature, hermits were closely integrated with the world around them. They were part of lay society. In England, hermits were sometimes expected to take on such mundane functions as hospitality, chapel tending, work on roads and bridges, as well as the spiritual counseling and advice to lay people we might expect. In literature, they appear as especially attuned and sympathetic to knighthood, and often have come from the same social milieu as knights, indeed have often been knights themselves until age and waning capacity closed a chivalric career. A second characteristic is of equal importance. Hermits were, in Angus Kennedy's words, not opposed to but rather on the outskirts of the ecclesiastical hierarchy proper. The combination is perfect for making them ideal purveyors of religion to the practitioners of chivalry. With thoughts of lay independence and suspicions of clerical aggrandizement in their heads, knights could readily appreciate the somewhat marginal position of pious hermits within the ranks of the clergy. Benedictine monks and some clerics understandably took offense at the hermits' claims and their criticisms of older monastic forms. They sometimes directed sarcastic attacks at what they considered anarchic, orderless, headless hermits. Their scorn and criticism, of course, make the same point as the knightly endorsement from an opposing direction. These men are outsiders, not fully citizens of the world of clergies. Not all hermits were, in fact, priests, and even those who were priests seemed more engaged in the life of the laity and less entrenched in clergies than their fellows in monastery, parish church, or episcopal court. As Jean Beckwith wrote, if Western Eremitism was clearly clerical, it was also lay, finding its recruits among laymen as well as monastics, and combining them in a perfect symbiosis. He notes that the master of one of the prominent eremitical orders in mid-12th century France, the Order of Grandmont, was Pierre Bernard, a former knight who had only recently become a priest. Some scholars are not sure that all hermits had even received the license from the bishop theoretically necessary for entering the eremitical life. In fact, there is always a faint scent of the protest movement lingering about hermits. Jean Leclerc notes that in the 11th and 12th century they represented something of a movement or reaction, especially against contemporary monasticism. Angus Kennedy argues that by the 14th century hermits in literary works took on the role of critics of the church of their day. In short, hermits combined a maximum of recognized piety and involvement in the life of the laity with a minimal possession or exercise of ecclesiastical authority. To this potent brew they added a dash of criticism of the church establishment. Their undoubted piety was buttressed by the asceticism that always registered as authentic piety in medieval consciousness. This very asceticism showed the heroic character of the hermits, a quality which, of course, struck a responsive chord in knights. Each group undertook its characteristic adventures and put the body in peril for a higher goal. Knightly recognition and approval of this asceticism appears regularly in chivalric literature. A hermit in the Pearl's Vows, we learn, has not stepped outside his hermitage for forty years. Yui's hermit patently shows his holy life in his worn clothing, worn body, many tears. In the first continuation of the Perse Vow, a hermit keeps a vow of silence through each night, visited by a helpful angel. Ascetic discipline wins for the hermit's particularly clear and direct channels to God and his angels. Through this efficient access to divine power hermits can foretell the future, explain the past, heal the injured. The Mordar II even explains Gawain's mysterious increase of prowess at noon by the fact of his baptism by a holy hermit at that hour. In the Pearl's Vows, Lancelot receives from a hermit the tempting offer to take upon himself Lancelot's sin with the queen. The gesture is noble, but Lancelot declines, confident that God will understand. Such powers are all the more attractive to knights when the hermits have actually known the chivalric life and come from the proper social class. The continuation of Cratine's Perceval by Gerbert shows us a band of twelve hermits led by a hermit king, all former knights. Lancelot and Yvain stop at a hermitage in the Lancelot and find two good men, 
one who was a priest and another who had been a knight and was the uncle of the two knights' guide. The hermit who gives Lancelot useful information early in the Lancelot was very old and had been a knight, one of the handsomest in the world. He had turned to religion in his prime, when he had lost within one year all twelve of his sons. A hermit in the Pearl's Vows had been a knight in King Uther's household for forty years, and then a hermit for another thirty years. Time and again romance authors show us hermits who have long been knights, and who can thus speak to other knights on a level plane of social equality and shared vocation. A hermit whom Yvain meets had been a knight errant even before Arthur was crowned. And I'd have been a member of the round table, but I refused to join because of a knight member for whom I bore a mortal hatred, and whose arms I later cut off. So after he was crowned, King Arthur disinherited me. One hermit after another is presented as a former knight. In the Lancelot du Lac, to pick an example almost at random, we meet a hermit who had in his previous profession been one of the finest knights in the world. The hermits who are so thick on the ground in the quest of the Holy Grail likewise prove often to have been knights. The hermit who hears Lancelot's confession in this text at least has a brother who is a knight and who can be called upon for the essential horse and armor Lancelot has lost. In the Pearl's Vows a hermit does one better and keeps a stable of war horses ready for use by worthy knights in need. This is the sort of cleric a chivalrous audience could really appreciate. Some of the hermits never quite block out the trumpet calls of their former calling. One who keeps arms to fight against robbers and villains appears in the Pearl's Vows and later in that romance hermits enthusiastically join with Perceval in battle. It is more common, of course, for hermits to consider that warfare continues in their new lives but takes a different form. In singing their masses, they are often said to wear the armor of our Lord. The link becomes even stronger when we note how many heroes themselves end their lives as hermits. Perceval becomes a hermit at the end of the quest of the Holy Grail. Lancelot, Bleobaris, Gerflet, Hector are all hermits in the closing pages of the Mordar II and again, in Mallory's great book. William of Orange, who has retired from knighthood to become a rather unhappy monk in William in the monastery, hears the voice of God telling him in a dream to leave that community and become a hermit. Some hermits even reverse the usual pattern and turn to the greatest knights for advice or even spiritual intercession. In the Pearl's Vows, for example, a hermit takes counsel of Perceval because of his good life, and another asks Galahad to intercede with God for him. The projection of knightly lay independence in chivalric literature could scarcely be clearer. Did this portrayal of hermits and the elaboration of mythology and learning really mean anything to a knight setting out on a countryside campaign or even on a crusade? Would any particular knight care about in some imagined hermit's advice about Joseph of Arimathea, the shield of Lancelot, or the miracles of Galahad? Knights need not have been primarily men of ideals to have ideals that mattered to them. If chivalric literature presents critiques and hopes for the reform of chivalry, it also reveals a good deal of the basic religious attitudes commonly held by knights. Their piety may have been thoroughly formal and from a modern, ideal perspective may look distressingly devoid of deep spirituality, but it need not have been less real for all that, nor less a guide to their conduct. These attitudes constitute a form of lay piety that was eminently practical. The knights wanted to be pious, orthodox Christians. They also insisted on a valorization of their profession of arms which would link them, finally, with divine order. Ideas that carried such weight mattered to them. Sheer a tradition of ideas which oppose some but not all violence. The very sir, necessity as well as intellectual heritage gave the medieval church vival of Christian society was no mere abstraction for people with vivid memories of the breakup of the Carolingian order, if not of the breakup of the parent order of Rome. Continuing might of Islam, made so painfully evident in the Holy Land, brought their memories and fears quite up to date. Even within Christendom none could doubt that the evils inherent in an imperfect world would require the use of armed force in their solution, as they always had. These ever-present problems were redoubled by the interlocking set of changes taking place so rapidly and to such significant effect in high medieval Europe. All three apexes of our triangle of power relationships, clergy, royat, and chevalry, 
were by the late 11th and 12th centuries coming into full vigor and were taking on sharper intellectual focus. The church was confronted by the rise of knighthood, the emergence of a parent form of the Western European state, and new socioeconomic, urban, demographic patterns in society. Finding the right role for violence in general, and for knighthood in particular thus gave churchmen sleepless nights. The context within which clerical ideas on violence took shape may thus be as important as the ideas themselves, considered in the abstract. Despite the intellectual precedents available, the actual situation in the world of the late 11th century seems dramatically new. The great heritage from the patristic and Carolingian past, even Augustine's ideas on just war, would have to find their proper fit in this brave new world of papal power, crusade, and canon law. From this complex mix of theological ideas with the exigencies of socio-political change emerged a range of ideologies with high praise for an ideal knighthood at one end, bitter denunciation of the evils of knighthood at the other. If over time more and more influential voices added their significant opinion at the positive end of the scale, clerical views on chivalry were always reform views, constantly mixing praise and denunciation to produce a society in which the church could live and an armed force with which the church could work. With their bookish love of wordplay, the clerics perfectly captured the stark endpoints on the scale of their thought by using two terms of opposite tenor, differing in only one letter. Was chivalry, they liked to ask, the ideal service of God, or was it simply badness? After the Gregorian reform, led by a vigorous line of 11th century popes, had notionally drawn the world of clergies out of the somewhat smothering embrace of secular society, papal reformers found themselves confronted by issues of violence in all of their starkness. Could the leadership of the church coerce enemies who opposed its realization of the will of God? Could the pope, only now achieving effective authority even within the church, declare and direct war? Should churchmen personally bear arms in good causes? If they could not participate directly, how could ecclesiastical leadership guide the coercive power and violence of laymen? Scholars generally hold that the Gregorians wrought significant changes in ecclesiastical views on such questions. Many even consider the Reformers' views, in particular those of Leo IX and Gregory VII, truly revolutionary in their willingness to consider violence and warfare in a good cause not merely regrettable but even praiseworthy. Peter Damien and Cardinal Humbert, chief counselors of Gregory VII, argued against the use of force even in defense of the faith or in the struggle with heretics. Yet if both points of view continue to find defenders, Gregory is commonly considered the principal single architect of subsequent medieval Christian ideas of holy war. If soldier saints had been canonized in earlier times, this was usually despite their military calling. Significantly, Gregory considered some contemporary knights, such as Erlembald of Milan, to be virtual saints because of their warring for right order in the world. His letters crackle with martial terminology. The warfare of Christ, the service of St. Peter, the vassals of St. Peter. His enemies have to be resisted, even to blood. At one point he chastised Abbot Hugh of Cluny for having dragged, or at least received, Duke Hugh of Burgundy into the peace of the Cluniac order. The abbot should rather, the Pope wrote, have permitted the duke to remain in the world to carry out his much-needed service of another sort, the legitimate military function of a layman. At least briefly, he tried to enlist the knighthood of Europe in a grandiose campaign to overawe the old Norman enemies of the papacy in Italy and then to march off triumphantly to eastern lands. There they could aid the Christians in Constantinople against the unbelievers and, in the process, enforce Roman supremacy over the eastern church. Even before his calls to arms in the famous struggle with the Emperor Henry IV, calls which a hostile archbishop characterized as declaring war against the whole world, Gregory VII found his enemies accusing him of unheard of uses of force. The accusations could only increase during that struggle. The antipope Wybert of Ravenna, who pictured Gregory standing abashed at the Last Judgment, asked, rhetorically, what defense he could give when the blood of the many slaughtered cries out against him, Avenge our blood, O Lord. Reporting the accusations circulating against Gregory, Winrich of Trier wrote to the Pope, They declare that, You incite to bloodshed secular men seeking pardon for their sins, that murder, for whatever reason it is committed, is of small account, that the property of St. Peter must be defended by force 
and to whomsoever dies in this defense you promise freedom from all his sins, and you will render account for any man who does not fear to kill a Christian in Christ's name. One of these critics, Sigibert of Jemblix, presented the anti-Gregorian position with even greater succinctness in a sharp rhetorical thrust. Where does it come from, this novel authority by which sinners are offered freedom from punishment for sins which they have committed and licensed to commit fresh ones, without confession and penance? What a window of wickedness you have thus opened up to mankind. Gregory and his supporters would, of course, deny and counter such charges, but another feature of their ideology would have brought no denials from their lips or pens. They pressed forward an effort to disarm the clergy as a complement to directing the armed might of knighthood. The clerics might rightly direct righteous war. They were not to participate, sword in hand. Legislation and councils striving to reform the church often aimed to take weapons from the sacred hands of clerics, no less than to remove women from their eager arms. Apparently the former effort was much more successful than the latter. In his account of the beginnings of the Gregorian movement, Orderic Vitalis, for example, links the evil of clerical sexuality with the bearing of arms by the clergy. He complains with practiced monastic indignity that the clerks could more readily be parted from their weapons than from their women. The aftermath of the visit of Leo, the ninth to Reims in 1049, made this result clear to him. From that time, the fatal custom of clerics bearing arms began to wither away little by little. The priests were ready enough to give up bearing arms, but even now they are loath to part with their mistresses, or to live chaste lives. One of the most significant conductors for the high voltage of reforming ideas was the emerging science of canon law. The positive Gregorian concept of Christian warfare entered canon law through the writings of Bishop Anselm of Lucca, papal legate in Lombardy and publicist for the Gregorian cause. By 1140 these ideas had then moved forward another and even longer step. Combining Anselm's ideas with those of the slightly later Evo of Chartres, and drawing heavily on the Church Fathers, the monk Gratian created an ecclesiastical law of war as a particular species of violence in his influential Decretum, a work which later theologians and writers on the canon law had always to take into account. In Causa 23 of this work, the first question asks pointedly, is military service a sin? Although here and elsewhere in his work, Gratian quotes authorities who would answer in the affirmative, his conclusion follows Augustine in asserting that such service is not inherently sinful. In fact, truly just warfare was not simply acceptable, it could be pleasing in the eyes of the Almighty. Well in advance of enthusiastic writers of vernacular manuals on chivalry and of the great chivalric chanson and romances, Gratian even proclaimed prowess a gift of God. Such prowess exercised in just warfare became an instrument leading to the blessed goal of peace. If the warriors had the right motives, if the war was called by proper authority in order to right a wrong or injury, then all was well. Gratian was especially concerned about proper authority, but his list of such authorities, reflecting the situation in his world, seems to have been fairly comprehensive. It did not absolutely exclude anyone from the emperor or king down to the most lowly vassal. Clerics were prohibited from direct participation by bearing arms themselves, and even from directly ordering bloodshed. But they could encourage others to defend right, correct wrongs, protect the church. God was, of course, the ultimate authority for violence, but his church could direct just war on his behalf. Canonists would work to fill in these broad outlines for generations to come. For our purposes, the window of opportunity opened for a clerical valorization of knighthood is immediately obvious. The law of the church, though with many qualifications and caveats, accepted the need for knightly violence. For all of its fears of the Melites, the cloister, too, proved to be a source of ideas valorizing emerging chivalry. A much-discussed parallel between knights on the one hand and monks and hermits on the other provided one of the most venerable means by which blessings descended upon knighthood. Churchmen frequently asserted that knights and monks were both called to serve. Significantly, the Latin verb they used, militate, could mean to fight as well to serve and, in fact, they easily considered the service of both knights and monks a form of warfare against evil, in one dimension conducted in the spirit, in the other in physical battle. All the Melites Christi, monks and knights alike, in other words, were warriors engaged one way or another in battle against evil, even as Christ himself had been. 
In a scene of wonderful symbolic content, white-robed monks in the quest of the Holy Grail literally pull the knight-errant Galahad into their religious house to enjoy their hospitality. On his part, he recognizes them, the author tells us, as brothers. In this same text, the hermits who so prominently dispense religious advice regularly put on the armor of Holy Church, or the armor of our Lord, when saying Mass for the knights. Orderic Vitalis draws upon the world of war to write of monks using the weapon of prayer. He can use the term martyr for knights who suffer death on their crusade. When he pins the phrase soldiers of Christ, he sometimes means monks, sometimes crusading knights, writing in praise of a man named Gerald, a pious clerk in the household of the Earl of Chester, Orderic says, he did his best to convert the men of the court to a better way of life by showing them the examples of their forebears. He rightly condemned the worldly wantonness that he saw in many and deplored the great negligence that most of them showed for the worship of God. To great lords, simple knights, and noble boys alike he gave salutary counsel, and he made a great collection of tales of the combats of holy knights, drawn from the Old Testament and more recent records of Christian achievements, for them to imitate. He told them vivid stories of the conflicts of Demetrius and George, of Theodore and Sebastian, of the Theban Legion and Maurice its leader, and of Eustace, supreme commander of the army and his companions, who won the crown of martyrdom in heaven. He also told them of the holy champion, William of Orange, who after long service in war renounced the world and fought gloriously for the Lord under the monastic rule. And many profited from his exhortations, for he brought them from the wide ocean of the world to the safe harbor of life under the rule. Orderic presents a fascinating compromise here, suggesting, indirectly, the validity of a knightly life in the world. So long as religion is not neglected and the battles are fought for good causes, but ending conventionally with the ultimate monastic solution, it would be better for the knights to become monks, at least at the end of an active life in the world. Of course, many knights in fact heard this call, William Marshall only the most famous of them. In the writings of St. Bernard, himself the son of a knight, these military metaphors appear regularly. An Augustinian canon, who had given up his religious vocation and returned to the world, was admonished in a letter from Bernard, Show yourself in the fight. If Christ recognizes you in battle, he will recognize you. On the last day, he wrote to Robert de Chatillon to return to his fellow soldiers in the monastery at Clairvaux. Arise, soldier of Christ, I say arise. Shake off the dust and return to the battle. Bernard tells Robert he is sleeping while his house is invaded by armed men scaling the walls, pouring in at every entrance. Crusade was clearly another conduit for transmitting clerical valorization of knightly violence. In the era of Crusade, as Christian society was being divided by clerical intellectuals into three distinct orders, knighthood became, in clerical minds, an ordo. Knights became, that is, one of these divisions of society approved by God one of the orders within which one might achieve salvation. At a time when much cultural attention was likewise focused on penance and the means of achieving salvation, when salvation may have appeared to many almost as a treasure securely kept behind monastic walls, contemporaries sensed the novelty of creating this new order not simply for laymen, but specifically for knights, with all their enthusiasm for killing. In the early 12th century Guibert of Nogent, a monk and supporter of Gregorian ideals, wrote that knights who wore the crusader's cross could now find salvation without taking the traditional path of giving up their way of life and entering a monastery. God in our time has introduced the holy war so that the knighthood and the unstable people who shed each other's blood in the way of pagans might have a new way to win salvation. They need not choose the life of a monk and abandon the world in accordance with the vows of a rule, but can obtain God's grace through their own profession in their accustomed freedom and secular dress. Otto of Freising, writing towards the middle of the 12th century, thought of crusaders in similar terms. At a time of senseless war at home, some, for Christ's sake, despising their own interests and considering that it was not for naught that they were wearing the girdle of knighthood, set out for Jerusalem and there, undertaking a new kind of warfare, so conducted themselves against the enemies of the cross of Christ that, continually bearing about in their bodies the death of the cross, they appeared by their life and conversation to be not soldiers but monks. The special service of crusade thus covered the sins of the knights 
and could pry open the doors of paradise itself. The troubadour Americ de Pegulhan exults that knights can obtain honor down here and joy in paradise, and manage all this without renouncing our rich garments, our station in life, courtesy and all that pleases and charms. He is wonderfully relieved that no more is there need to be tonsured or shaved and lead a hard life in the most strict order if we can revenge the shame which the Turks have done us. The exchange is explicit and explicitly stated in some chansons. Christ died for the knights, they must be willing to die for him. The most influential monastic voice speaking to knighthood as crusade ideas gathered force was that of Bernard of Clairvaux, perhaps the most influential churchman of the first half of the 12th century. Bernard was willing to recognize a role for the hermaphroditic fusion of monk and knight in a special body of crusaders, the Order of the Knights Templar, for whom he wrote praise of the new knighthood. His approval of this new knighthood, unknown to ages gone by, is fulsome but specific. The Order ceaselessly wages a twofold war both against flesh and blood and against a spiritual army of evil in the heavens. The Templars can, he assures them, fight secure in their moral stature as God's warriors. The Knight of Christ, I say, may strike with confidence and die yet more confidently, for he serves Christ when he strikes, and serves himself when he falls. Neither does he bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of the good. If he kills an evildoer, he is not a man-killer, but, if I may so put it, a killer of evil. Bernard's last phrase recalls the wordplay with militia and militia of which he and other clerics made such telling use. But here the game elevates his ideal knights at the expense of their brothers among merely worldly chivalry. Some years later he granted his blessing to an even larger subset of the knightly in his preaching of the Second Crusade. At Vézelay in 1146, Bernard issued an eloquent call for crusaders, using the heavenly instrument of his voice to praise the work they would do even modifying on behalf of these knights his usual preference for the fight of the monk, whose warfare for the good was spiritual and interior, not physical and exterior. Contemporaries noted that his eloquence on behalf of crusading warfare won the approval of God, as the many miracles that took place at Vesely witnessed. In the preaching campaign that followed, Bernard traveled many miles through the kingdom of France and the empire. Finally, we should note that clerics gradually became willing to transfer the blessings they had long reserved for kingship to the Ordo of Knights, shifting the heavy mantle of praise and high responsibility from one set of shoulders to another. Jean Flory's detailed studies of knighting ceremonies, of church ritual and liturgy, of the legislation of church councils, and the ideas of clerical intellectuals and popularizers have skillfully illuminated this revealing change. The clerical tradition which had praised and legitimized the necessary societal role of Christian Roman emperors, sub-Roman Germanic kings, Carolingian emperors, and their successors, came in the course of the High Middle Ages to bless and praise the ideal role of knights. The knights were needed in hard times. Like kings, and even in place of kings who were failing to fulfill their function, they could defend the church, keep the peace, protect the weak. Idealistic reformers assign knights particular responsibility for defending widows and orphans. If originally and ultimately such responsibility rested with God, it had devolved in turn upon the Jewish people, the Christian church, and then, more specifically and exclusively, Christian kingship. When the power of post-Carolingian kings slipped over much of Europe, the knights came to share this aspect of royal responsibility. Over time, this more generous view of knighthood not only predominated but generalized to cover the entire order of the chivalrous. A form of sacralization came to rest on the knighthood which clerics so decidedly needed for all of the business of life, sadly requiring force. Descendants of the knights whose excesses were condemned by the leaders of the peace movement heard their praises sung as at least potentially blessed warriors. They could become the knights of St. Peter at the time of Gregory VII, or the Knights of Christ when fighting under later crusade banners, whether the foe consisted of Muslims in the Holy Land or heretics or declared papal enemies within Christendom. Finally, the blessings spread from the select few to the generality of knights, as knighthood began to be more or less equated with nobility over much of Europe, as clerics attributed major aspects of royal power and responsibility to the Ordo of Knights. Not just crusaders, but all knights could be saved within this order if only they carried out their mission faithfully, 
listened to each sermonette from their clerical betters, and heeded the warnings. The formula of willingness to die for Christ, who was willing to die for humanity, shifts easily to a willingness to die for the Lord or King who puts his body at risk for his men. This laicization and generalization of crusade valorization is sometimes quite explicit. In the Lancelot du Lac and in the Lancelot, the knight Farian explains to his fellow vassals why they must fight for their liege lords, the young Bors and Lionel. If we die for them, it will be to our honor in the world and to our renown as warriors, because for the sake of rescuing his liege lord from death a man is duty-bound to put his own life ungrudgingly at risk. If anyone then dies, he dies as sure of salvation as if he were slain fighting the Saracens, the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fighting for one's Lord has taken on the aura of fighting for the Lord. The point is made even more broadly and strikingly later in the Lancelot. A former knight, who leaves the religious life he has adopted to return to the world to fight against an enemy troubling his son, argues this case in discussion with Gawain. Is he who destroys life without justification not worse than a Saracen? If I went overseas to fight against the destroyers of Christendom, it would be judged praiseworthy, for I must do all in my power to avenge the death of Jesus Christ, since I am a Christian. Therefore I'll go to avenge my son, who is a Christian, and help him against those who are in the place of the unbelievers. Such views had a long future. Clerics must have had their doubts about the logic as well as the behavior of the knights. But they had few alternatives. They crossed their fingers and kept preaching their ideals, accepting from the blessings they bestowed on the high order of chivalry only those who burned churches, looted and raped the poor, and caused general mayhem through unjust warfare. The order of knighthood seems to sum up clerical valorization. Evidently written by a cleric and possibly a priest, this manual provides what its editor, Keith Busby, terms a mystical religious meaning for the ceremony by which a knight is made. Each step, each piece of equipment is given a moral or religious meaning. The bath shows the knight cleansed from sin. The bed on which he rests figures the bed he will earn in paradise. The intent to praise knighthood and fit it into medieval Christian society is obvious. The audience whom the author seems to be addressing is clerical, as the following statement near the end of the manual indicates. Knights, whom everybody should honor. Have us all to guard. And if it were not for knighthood, our lordship would be of little worth, for they defend holy church, and they uphold justice for us against those who would do us harm. Our chalices would be stolen from before us at the table of God, and nothing would ever stop it. But their justice which defends us in their persons is decisive. The good would never be able to endure if the wicked did not fear knights, and if there were only Saracens, Albigensian, and Barbarians, and people of evil faith. The clerical case for the necessity of knighthood and the justification of their swords could scarcely be made more clearly. Clerics balanced approval of chivalry as an ideal type with the most blistering criticism of the ideals and practices of chivalry actually encountered in the world. The peace movement, at work between the late 10th and 12th centuries, overlapped the gestational age of chivalry. Despite much debate, most historians think that the warriors of middling and lesser rank, the Castellans, and their subordinate Melites were the targets of much of the legislation. Clerics wanted licit war to be limited to the higher authorities, which meant that the bishops and abbots pinned their hopes for social order on the great lords, at least in the absence of effective royal control. In the specific form known as the Truce of God, the prohibition against fighting was often relaxed in favor of the lay authority considered licit by the churchmen. A count or duke could thus licitly fight against those engaged in acts of illicit violence. Not surprisingly, at least in Normandy, Flanders, and Catalonia, the peace of God had, before the end of the 11th century, become the peace of the count or duke. By the mid-12th century, it had become the king's peace in France. Some scholarship takes us beyond major peace councils to informal efforts, which are no less significant for our themes. With the approval of the count, the monks of the Monastery of Lobs in Flanders, for example, left their house, ruined by war, to take the relics of their patron saint, Erzmer, on a tour in 1060. Among the many miracles recorded by the monks on this tour, the greatest was that the saint brought peace to the region in which interlocking feuds were everywhere. At Strazil, the writer noted, some knights were so hostile to each other that no mortal man could bring them to peace. 
At Liswedge, the problem centered on a young man named Robert who had a large following of knights. He would not reconcile with his enemy. Pressed by the monks and locals, he and this enemy lay prostrate before the saint for three hours. Robert gnashed his teeth, groaned, turned alternately pale and red, clawed the ground and ate dirt in sheer frustration with those who would rob him of revenge. Finally, the saint's reliquary dramatically spewed smoke and levitated. Robert pardoned his enemy and peace was made. The solemn rigors of the canon law can likewise show us clerical doubts and fears about the Melites. Although, as we have seen, Gratian's influential decretum created safe canonical space for just warfare, he seems to have sensed how hard it would be to make Christian charity the motivating force for fighting, how unlikely it would be for the knightly ranks of his day to give up such sinful motives as private revenge or plentiful booty. Frederick Russell argues, for example, that the prolix and pompous exhortations that Gratian and so many later canonists address to the knights show deep fears on just these points. As Russell writes, against the well-known greed, rapacity, and ferocity of the knightly class of his time Gratian, opposed the patristic portraits of the Christian soldier, thereby striking at the core of knightly practice. The canonists, with hope in their hearts, praised the military virtues, in other words, but they recognized and feared the military vices so evident in their world, and they spoke to that fear. Though crusading epitomized knightly lay piety, most knights for most of their lives were not crusaders. The majority of their fighting was done at home against their fellow knights. Clerics constantly drew the sharpest contrast between the ordinary conduct of knighthood and the special service of crusade. Even Urban II, as he preached the crusade at Claremont in 1095, took this approach, if we can at all trust later accounts of his famous crusade sermon. He seems to have stressed the evils inherent in the knightly life and presented crusading as a means of atonement. The chronicler Fulcher of Chartres pictures Urban saying, Now will those who once were robbers become Christi Melites. Those who once fought brothers and relatives will justly fight barbarians. Those who once were mercenaries for a few farthings will obtain eternal reward. Baldrick of Dole gives the Pope an even more outspoken speech of condemnation with a smaller escape hatch of virtue opened for the knights. You are proud. You tear your brothers to pieces and fight among yourselves. The battle that rends the flock of the Redeemer is not the militia Christi. Holy Church has reserved knighthood for itself, for the defense of its people, but you perverted in wickedness. You oppressors of orphans and widows, you murderers, you temple defilers, you lawbreakers, who seek the rewards of rapacity from spilling Christian blood. If you wish to save your souls, either abandon the profession of arms or go boldly forth as Christi Melites and hasten to the defense of the Eastern Church. Whether or not these are words actually spoken by Urban from his platform at Claremont, they clearly establish the continuing clerical criticism of knighthood and the straight gate through which it had to pass to meet the approval of clergies. If chroniclers wrote the Pope's words for him, their own words flowed in the same vein. William of Tyre thought the Crusaders needed the opportunity to redeem themselves by pious work. Their habit was to commit theft, arson, rape, murder. William of Malmesbury agreed. He thought that the departure of the Melites as Crusaders meant that Christians at home could now live in peace. Views from the knights' fellow warriors in the cloisters had long been fearful and condemnatory about knightly practice, however much they like to imagine a brotherly parallel between knights and monks in theory. We have already noted some expression of these monastic fears when we looked at Orderic's chronicle and Suger's biography of Louis VI. To their witness, we should add that great voice of monasticism, Bernard de Clairvaux. If he sang the praises of the select company of Knights Templar and of the larger body of those who went on the Second Crusade, for ordinary knights, St. Bernard could scarcely restrain his contempt. To these men, fighting for the devil, go plain words of warning. If you happen to be killed while you are seeking only to kill another, you die a murderer. If you succeed, and by your will to overcome, and to conquer you perchance kill a man, you live a murderer. What an unhappy victory! Warming to his subject, Bernard heaps scorn on the combination of vanity and violence in chivalry as it was practiced all around him. What then, O oh knights, is this monstrous error and what this unbearable urge which bids you fight with such pomp and labor, and all to no purpose except death and sin?
You cover your horses with silk and plume your armor with I know not what sort of rags. You paint your shields and your saddles. You adorn your bits and spurs with gold and silver and precious stones, and then in all this glory you rush to your ruin with fearful wrath and fearless folly. Since most knights, he is convinced, are fighting for the devil rather than for God, he does not hesitate to call them impious rogues, sacrilegious thieves, murderers, perjurers, and adulterers. When they are converted to the new knighthood of the temple, there will be twofold joy. A twofold joy and a twofold benefit, since their countrymen are as glad to be rid of them as their new comrades are to receive them. Both sides have profited from this exchange, since the latter are strengthened and the former are now left in peace. On one occasion Bernard backed up his ideas with dramatic effects on some knights who visited Clairvaux, but refused his entreaties to put down their arms and give up tourneying for the Lenten season. After Bernard gave them beer which he had blessed, they soon left the secular militia and became monks. The voice from the schools could be no less critical, or at least no less demanding than that from the cloister. In writings such as his sermon Ad Melites, the noted scholar Alain de Lille wields a pen as effective and almost as sharply pointed as that of St. Bernard. In one important sense, his position is more comprehensively tolerant than that of Bernard. He sees a valid knightly role extending well beyond that of knight monks as a special subset of crusaders. In an unusual reinterpretation of the famous image of two swords, he even suggests that knights possess them both. They belt on the physical sword to secure temporal peace. The second sword, he says, is spiritual an interior weapon by which they can secure the peace of their own hearts. But he charges knighthood in general with terrible sins of omission and commission. They should be devoted followers of the military saints. They should defend their homeland and the church their mother. They should fight her enemies boldly. They should protect widows and orphans. But how do they act in fact? They show only the outward appearance of knighthood, not realizing that these exterior signs are but figures of the true knighthood within that which is nourished by the word of God in their breasts. Their knighthood becomes utterly empty, only a shell. Thus, what they practice is not true knightly service, but plundering, not militia, but rapina. In short, they become thieves, devastating the poor. They avoid fighting the enemies of Christ, but make fellow Christians the victims of their swords. In his most telling phrase, a land denounces knights for sharpening their swords in the viscera of their mother the church. His criticism of knightly pillaging and looting appears vividly in a story told of knights from the region bursting into a land's theology classroom at Montpellier. The knights demanded that he tell them what constituted the highest degree of courtesy. An unruffled Alain pronounced the opinion that it lay in giving liberally and beneficently. Though the knights all liked this answer, they could only have been less pleased as Alain turned the tables with much didactic coolness and asked them what, correspondingly, was the deepest degree of villainy. When the knights failed to agree on an answer, he explained archly that it lay in living by looting the poor as they did. Of course, no professor easily tolerates a rude invasion of his classroom, but, as we have already seen, Alain gave similar views on the evils of knighthood, from the uninterrupted quiet of his study, in his sermon, Ad Miletus. John of Salisbury is generally more accepting. Since he clothes knights in the classical drapery of his self-conscious learning, his view allows for more talk of the loyal service owed by Melites to the prince and to the commonwealth. He wants his readers to know he is not hostile to military men or the military life. He tries to think of contemporary knights as the Roman soldiers he so admires in his books on antiquity, fitted into a world properly directed by clergies. The armed soldier, in fact, no less than the spiritual one is limited by the requirements of office to religion and the worship of God, since he must faithfully and according to God obey the prince and vigilantly serve the republic. Given such a military force, he announces his willingness to undertake its defense against whoever attacks it and will fully justify it on the authority of God. He knows, though, that the world in which he lives is not the world of his books. He would that the knights of his own day were a stalwart, ideal soldiery selected by careful examination, disciplined in constant drill, and enlisted for true public service. He is thus disappointed and critical on two levels. First, he confronts the knights on their own ground, on the level of sheer professionalism. 
The knights of his day are simply not good enough at their tasks as warriors, not bold enough, not truly committed to their high and necessary vocation. The Roman discipline is gone, he laments, largely because of effeminacy and luxury. But his second criticism is more pointed, even if John, ever cautious, gives it less space. The wrong people hold the swords and use them in wrongful pursuits. Many of those who call themselves Melites are in reality no more soldiers than men or priests and clerics whom the church has never called into orders. He knows, from his books, what to call these men. For in old writings those who use arms outside the decree of law are called murderers and bandits. These untrue Melites believe that the glory of their military service grows if the priesthood is humiliated. If the authority of the church becomes worthless, if they would so expand the kingdom of man that the empire of God contracts, if they declare their own praises and flatter and extol themselves by false eulogy. Their courage manifests itself mainly if either their weapons or their words pierce the clergy or the unarmed soldiers. Such men serve rage or vanity or avarice or their own private will rather than defending the church and the poor, pacifying the land, and even giving their lives if needed. Though Melites ideally offer their service to the Republican Church, the number is legion of those who when they offer their belt upon the altar for the purpose of consecrating themselves to military service, their evil works seem to cry aloud and proclaim that they have approached the altar with the intention of declaring war against it and its ministers, and even against God himself who is worshipped there. They are more like practitioners of militia than members of the true militia. In such passages, John seems to step away from the classical backdrop that so often formed the stage set for his writing and to speak plainly about his own age. Gerald of Wales, a bridge figure connecting this world of scholarship with the busy world of clerical administrators, often adopts the mores of the world he describes in his historical writing. Yet even he can slip in telling critiques. If he praises the knights from England and the Welsh marches who invaded Ireland in the reign of Henry II, he can note archly that their work were better done if they had paid due reverence to the Church of Christ, not only by preserving its ancient rites and privileges inviolate, but also by hallowing their new and sanguinary conquest, in which so much blood had been shed, and which was stained by the slaughter of a Christian people, by liberally contributing some portion of their spoils for religious use. But, this has been the common failing of all our countrymen engaged in these wars from their first coming over to the present day.